We've been talking about, uh, uh, we've been walking our way through First and Second Thessalonians. Uh, we began this on, on January 1st, and, and we're, we're not even, uh, we're in chapter 4. We'll finish up chapter 4 today, okay? But we still have chapter 5 to walk through, and then we're into Second Thessalonians. So I'm, I'm looking forward especially to this week and next week, Okay. It's important that you know the cultural context in which Paul is writing this letter to the believers in Thessalonica. In Paul's day, the pagan world had no hope after death, which explains why the culture turned to hedonism. Okay, if you need a good definition of hedonism, it is the absolute pursuit of pleasure. It is, the, it is the pursuit of pleasing yourself. That is the essence of hedonism. And it's expressed in many different ways. Last week we talked about how Paul talked about sexual sin. That is one aspect of hedonism, pleasing yourself. Jesus, though, repeated the motto of the pagan culture in a story that he told about a rich fool. So I, I just want to start there this morning. It's found in Luke chapter 12. And don't worry, I'm not preaching. I'm just, I'm just telling you a little bit about, uh, about this. So if you want to, you can go to your U version notes. You can follow along. This scripture will be in there, okay? But check this out. Jesus tells this story, and here's, here's how it goes. There was a rich man, okay, that had fertile farm that produced an abundance of of crops, okay? He said to himself one, one day, what should I do? I don't have room for all of my crops. So he says, I know. I'm going to tear down my barns. I'm going to build bigger ones. And then I'll have room enough to store all my wheat and all, and all the other goods th- that are produced. And then I'll sit back, he said. Now listen, here's the motto. He says, and then I'll sit back and say to myself, My friend, you've stored away for years to come. Now take it easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. How many of you have ever heard that phrase? That's the motto of hedonism. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we may die. But God said to him, listen to what God says to the rich fool. But God said to him, You fool, you will die this very night. And then who will get everything that you've worked for? Yes, Jesus said, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth but not have a rich relationship with God. You can have all the earth, and listen, you you can name them. Most of us can name wealthy people that we know in this world. But friends... All of that, all of that is wasted if we don't have a rich relationship with God. Jesus exposed the bankrupt philosophy, not just of his day, but of our day. Please yourself. Eat, drink, be merry, for tomorrow we may die. That's the best corrupt philosophy of of not just Jesus' day, but ours as well. The pagan had no assurance that the unbeliever had no assurance that for what would happen after he died. But Jesus tells the crowds that, if you read this in Luke 11, you'll see, Jesus tells the crowds that there's more to live for than pleasing yourself. Friends, we're living for what's next. We're living this life for what's eternal. Amen? Come on, if you're not, then I can understand why you're afraid of death. If you're not, then I can understand why, why you're uncertain about what's next. Jesus actually goes on here in Luke 11. He goes on to teach his disciples about pursuing the kingdom of God above all else. It's found in verse 31. And and he also talks to them about storing up treasure in heaven by giving and caring for people that are in need. 
And don't miss this in Luke's gospel. Don't miss this. He says, the master's coming back. Jesus warned them to be ready for his return. And he promised that when the master returns, he will reward the servants who are ready. I better say that again. He will reward the servants who are ready, ready for his return. Look, you and I are not without hope. We don't, we don't know all the details of when, how, or what's next. And anybody that tells you they do is misleading you. We don't know. And I know there's a movie out right now, left, the latest Left Behind movie. I get it. Maybe some of you have watched it. I have not seen it yet. I, I, I'm confessing that. Okay, I have several friends, pastor friends that have watched it. They said it was good. Okay, but here's the thing. That is a fictional account. We don't know what, how, or when. We only know what the Bible tells us. And this is what I want you to know. Jesus is calling you to be ready and waiting for his return. Jesus is calling you to be ready and waiting. That, and that word waiting literally means longing for, looking forward to his return. That's where we're going today, okay? And next week as well. All right, here's the, uh, I've just been alerted and, and I've just been reminded, um, I didn't do the version notes this week. <laughs> So, I, like Gina's in the front going, I told you so. Or, uh, you know, yeah, she asked me, and I just, whew. Uh, it's been that kind of week, okay? If that's the only thing I didn't do this week, I'm, it's okay, all right? I, I know some of you are desperately thinking, no, how am I going to remember everything he says? And how are we going to get to the different Bible verses he's going to bring up? Well, that, this is why you always bring up. Always bring your Bible, okay? It's always good. All right, I, I was going to say bring your backup, but this is, this is the primary source. Your phone's your backup, okay? So, all right, I know your phone's with you a lot more than your Bible, though. That, that's, that's the scary part. All right, maybe not on Sunday mornings, all right? So here, here's the thing. I, I'll post the notes up so you can, you can uh, look at them, and, and uh, uh, if you need to go old school and just write some notes, that's great. Uh, Gina does it both ways, so she's totally prepared, uh, but uh, the rest of us were kind of out of luck. Yeah, uh, I'll have the notes up, to, though, tomorrow, and then, and then you, can, uh, you can save those if you'd like and, and look at the scriptures that, that, we, that we look at today. Our primary scripture is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 today, so that's, this is where we'll be the majority of our time. The believers in Thessalonica were concerned about their loved ones who had died. So they asked Paul a question, what happens when you're a believer and you die? Paul answered their question with five core truths, five core beliefs. We're going to cover the first two. I know somebody just out there going, oh, no, five points in his message today. Okay. All right. Well, don't worry. The Holy Spirit and I worked this out this week, and we're going to do two today and three next week. All right? Everybody breathe a big sigh of relief. All right. Because uh, we, we were going to go right, we were going to preach right through lunch. I know. I know it. Can't beat the Baptist to the buffet if, you know, if, if, if we're doing five points. All right? So here, here's the thing. These are five truths. Here's the first truth. This is in response, okay? This is in response to their question, what happens to, to, to those that have died? And Paul says the first thing that we have is we have a revelation. We have God's word. We have God's truth. Look at it here in verse chapter 4, verse 13, and the first part of verse 15, okay? He says, and now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who've died, so you'll not grieve like people who have no hope. 
Look at the first part of verse 15. We tell you this directly from the Lord. What's beyond the veil of this life? What happens after we die? Look, those are the questions. Those are just a few of the questions that man has asked from ancient times all the way to present day. What happens next? What comes next? What happens after I die? It's a valid question. And the, Thess- the, the young believers in Thessalonica, they're asking this question. And Paul says, well, the first thing, before he, before he shares any information, he says, what I'm sharing to you is God's word. This is what we've received from the Lord. We're sharing truth. Revelation. Now that's a key word, um, I, and I understand uh, for the sake of of um, of kind of remembering things, uh, the word revelation is not in there. So let me let me define it very quickly. Revelation simply means something that is revealed to us that we could not know otherwise. Something supernaturally revealed to us that we could not know otherwise. Some insight, some wisdom, some, some not foreknowledge of what's to come. This is what Paul is saying here. He's saying, we tell you this directly from the Lord. In other words, what we're sharing with you, we've gotten from Jesus. Once upon a time, uh, there was the belief that as our knowledge increased and as our, as with the assistance of modern technology, we could answer this question, what's next? What happens after we die? Or at least we thought we'd have some more clarity regarding life after death. That has not happened to date. There's all kinds of speculation, isn't there, about what's next. Paul resolves the issue with truth. I like the way Eugene Peterson paraphrases it in the message. He says this, listen, we can tell you with complete confidence we have the master's word on it. Look, you've got God's word on what's next. You don't have to read. I know, look, there's a lot of books out there. There's a lot of material out there on the subjects that we're going to cover here in, in uh, verses 13 through verse uh, 18. A lot of books. But I'm going to tell you something. This is the book that counts. You can read all those life after death books or those books about someone that died and went to heaven or went to hell. And, 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 uh, and, but I'm telling you, those are not God's word. This is what tells us. Because for every, and I'm just going to say this as your pastor, for every good book that's out there about life after death, there are hundreds that are misleading. That's why, that's why this is our authority. This is our revelation. We have God's word on it. Okay? If you get that, shake your head at me. Okay? All right. So there's no need for us to speculate about what's next. We've got a revelation of God's truth on what's next. Now I'm going to tell you that there are some who teach about death and the afterlife using only verses from the Old Testament. That leads to confusion and error because the revelation that we have from God spans Old Testament into New Testament. And it's complete. It culminates in Jesus. So, so if, you go to, if you've been to a church or you've read materials from some ministries or churches that talk only about death and what comes next in the context of Old Testament, you're getting a very small part of God's picture of what's next. Jesus, the new, what God says in the New Testament and what God specifically says and does through, through the person of Jesus is what counts. Jesus was having a conversation with Nicodemus on the rooftop. You guys remember this? You might not remember the context, but I guarantee you, you remember the verse, John 3, 16. That truth 
John 3.16 was shared in a private conversation on a rooftop in the middle of the night with a, with a religious leader who, who wanted to know who Jesus was. John 3.16 says, for this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Paul says it this way to Timothy. I like this. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 10. He says, he broke, talking about Jesus, he broke the power of death and he illuminated the way to life and immortality through the good news. Come on, isn't that good news? It's good news that Jesus came and he, and he offers us life. Not, and, and, and I know some of you want to go to John 10, verses 9 and 10, you know, that the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus said, but I've come that you might have life and life to the full. Okay? But that life to the full is not just this side of eternity. That life to the full is beyond. It's what's next. It's life that goes beyond our last breath on this side of eternity. We don't have to speculate. We don't have to be afraid because that's what speculation is born out of. Speculation is born out of fear. Is that new to you? Speculation is born out of fear. We don't have to be afraid of death. We don't have to be afraid of what's next because God's Word gives us all the hope and comfort that we need. We've got God's Word on it. We've got revelation. Right here it tells us. Paul used the common euphemism, common, not just among Christians but among pagans as well, the common euphemism of of the word sleep to describe death. By the way, Jesus used the very same term in reference to Lazarus in John 11, 11. You guys remember this? He's talking to his disciples and he says, hey, our friend, our friend Lazarus has gone to sleep. And the disciples are like, oh, if he's sleeping, that's good because, because uh, he'll get better. And Jesus says, no. I, I, you can almost hear him wanting to say not heads. You know, no. I, I, maybe I'm just reading into there. I, I probably, because that's what, that's what I feel like he says to me. All right, so, so I shouldn't project. But he says, no. He says, he's died. He just says it. See, the word sleep was a common euphemism. It was a common word used to describe sleep. But Paul's use of that word was vastly different than the pagan or the cultural use of the word. Because pagans believed that when you die, you're done. When you die, you go to sleep, and in that sleep, there is no awakening. Here's what's interesting. Take note that he does not say that the soul goes to sleep at death. Those that have heard that teaching, and it's out there, and it's prominent, that the soul goes to sleep, have not read what God's Word has to say about it. Look how the Bible defines death and what happens to the body and soul or spirit. Tells us. James chapter 2, verse 26 says that the body apart from the spirit is dead. The body apart from the spirit is dead. Paul tells the Corinthians this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He says, He says, We would rather be away from these earthly bodies, for then if I'm away from this body, we will be with the Lord. To be away from this body is to be with the Lord. Not asleep. Not your soul asleep. Not your soul in purgatory. Not your soul in some definition. So there's been some teaching that, that, uh, that Christians are in this uh, kind of a waiting room before heaven. That's not what Paul says at all. That's not what God's Word says at all here. It says to be absent from the body is to be present with Christ. Paul tells the Philippians, you can read this on your own, Philippians chapter 2, he says to them, he says, I'd much rather be dead here 
and alive there. Look, if we, if we put our faith in God, if we trust in the finished work of Jesus on the cross for us, then our last breath, with our last breath, the soul leaves the body to be at home with the Lord. Is this new teaching for you? When you take your last breath on this side of eternity, you take your first breath in heaven. Not, you know, and somebody, somebody here is going, oh, yeah, but you know, what about time? What about the way time works? Look, this is our problem. We, are, we think linear. We think in terms of time. We think in terms of um, you know, hours, minutes, you know, seconds, minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, years. Okay, decades, centuries, eons. We think in terms of, because time for us is linear. Here's, here's some news for you. There isn't a clock in heaven. Not one. There's no, you can't take your, eye, your Apple Watch to heaven with you. Sorry. It might be on your body when you die, okay, but you're not taking it to heaven with you because there's no need for it there because time is not linear in heaven. Time ceases in heaven because, because heaven is forever, to quote one of my favorite movies. <laughs> heaven is forever. It's eternity. So when we take our last breath here, we take our first breath there. When we leave here, we are at home with the Lord. It's what he says, okay? It's what God says. It's what God reveals. I, like, I heard the story of a pastor who commiserated with a friend. He said, I hear your wife passed away. I'm very sorry. And the friend replied, uh, uh, the friend replied he says, no, I, di- I didn't lose my wife. The pastor was a little concerned immediately, thinking maybe he's in denial, he, and, and, and so he's thinking, uh-oh. He says, no, I didn't lose her. You can't lose something when you know where it is, and I know where she is. Friends, that's the blessed assurance that we have, the soul-deep comfort that we have when we put our trust in God's promises. We have his word on it, this revelation from God about what's next. Here's the second truth. It has to do with his return. Christ is coming again. We're going to talk more about this in the, in the other points as well, okay, because there's a lot to say about this. But check out what Paul writes here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, picking up at verses 14 and 15. He says, For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring with him the believers who've died. God will bring back with him the believers who've died. We tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living when the Lord returns will not meet him ahead of those who've died. Did you catch that Paul was careful not to use the term sleep to describe how Jesus died and rose again. He didn't say Jesus went to sleep and then was rose again. Very deliberately, Paul uses the word died. And and by the way, the Greek word is died. This is intentional. Why? Because Paul wanted the believers to know that Jesus died so that they would not have to fear death. Our Savior has already gone there, friends. He's been there and done that. And he lives again. And we are going to die, perhaps, okay, because some will die. Others will be alive when Jesus comes back. Okay, that's what he's saying here. Okay, that sounds like such a, you're looking around going, is it me? Am I going to die? I, I, no, we're not predicting that over yet, except that the Bible already does it. In Hebrews, it says it's appointed one, every man wants to die. Okay, so it's coming. The question is, are you ready? Right? So... 
Paul's giving us hope because Jesus died and rose again. You and I, even if we die, we will rise again. Paul references Jesus' return at least four times in this first letter to the Thessalonians. Four times. I would say that's a theme. Jesus is coming again. That promise should bring assurance and peace to every believer. God, God's Word also tells us that Jesus will return and bring His people with Him. And by the way, Jesus can't bring back those who've died when He returns unless they're with Him. Hello? So we just read it. So please, don't, that, that truth in itself corrects the error of soul sleep teaching. So here's the big question. We're going to handle this more in 2 Thessalonians. I'm just telling you, but we've got to deal with this right now. Because the big question, the elephant in the room question is when. When will Jesus return? Here, I'm going to tell you right now, okay? You ready? Hold on. I have a revelation from God's Word. I didn't have to do the math. I didn't have to look every, up every prophecy. All I had to do was look up what Jesus says in the Word. When is Jesus returning? No one knows. Period. No one knows. That's the answer to win. Don't you, don't you feel better now? No one knows. No, you see, there, see, you're here going, yeah, but I want to know. But I want to know. And you're just like the disciples. We're going to get to them here in just a second. See, the temptation is to figure it out. See, if you work out all the prophecies and the numbers, and, and, and all the signs of the times, then you can determine when Jesus comes, right? When Jesus is coming back. Wrong! You can't do that. And yet, we, and yet there are Christians that they're buying up the books. They're buying up the books. They say, hey, that's the four blood moons. Jesus is coming back. Hey, 88 reasons why Jesus is coming back in 1988. I know that was a long time ago, but it was a real book. And Christians bought the book. What they did is they bought the lie. No one knows when Jesus is coming back. So the, only the most arrogant of, of, of people would say that they know. And the most deceived of people would believe that. Don't be deceived when someone's running around saying, I know when Jesus is coming back. Because the Bible says... No one knows. That's why we need to read how Jesus responded to the question regarding the timing of his return. Matthew 24. It's a great place to go. So turn your Bibles there. Matthew 24. Okay. I wonder what he's got to say here. Some of you that already know where we're going, this is probably the most definitive in all of Jesus' teaching. This is the most definitive um, last days teaching that he did with his, with his followers. So Matthew 24, and, uh, and you could read the whole chapter, okay? Uh, I, in fact, the chapter heading in my New Living Translation says, Jesus speaks about the future, all right? But check, pick it up at verse 32. Pick it up at verse 32. This is what he says. He says, now learn a lesson from the fig tree. <laughs> Those co- first couple words. Now learn a lesson, not from somebody that wrote a book, not from somebody that believes they're a scholar, of, on, not from some expert on eschatology. That's the study of the end times, by the way. He says, learn a lesson from the fig tree. <laughs> when its branches bud and its leaves begin to sprout, you know that summer is near. Well, that makes sense. In the same way, you see all these things, 
And you can know his return is very near, right at the door. I tell you the truth, this generation will not pass from the scene until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will disappear, but my words will never disappear. Here we are, verse 36. However, no one knows the day or hour when these things will happen. Is that in red in your Bible? It is in mine. Who knows when? No one. Who said that? Jesus. Does, is that authoritative? Absolutely. That's all you need. So when somebody on the radio or somebody on TV or somebody on the internet or somebody, somebody's pushing a book and, and they're saying they know, you can say, no, you don't. I'm not buying your, I, I'm not going to line your pockets with my money. That's poor stewardship, friends. Because Jesus said that no one knows the day or hour when these things will happen. Not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself. Only the Father knows. Hello. <laughs> Jesus acknowledges that there will be signs of the, talk, of the times. He acknowledges that there will be indicators uh, of, of his imminent or soon return. Those signs will help us to know that his return is very near, right at the door, he says in verse 33. But the exact hour and day is known only by the Father. He reiterates this after his resurrection. This is pre-resurrection. So what about after the resurrection? Well, you've got to go to Acts chapter 1 to see what he says there. So flip over there, Acts chapter 1. Let's pick it up at verse... Oh, how about six? Listen to what he says. This is a conversation Jesus is having with his closest friends, the apostles. So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him. Did you hear that? They kept asking him. That means they didn't ask him once. They asked him two times, three times. Four, how many of you have a child that just keeps badgering you about something? You know what I'm talking about? When are we going to go? 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 What's it going to look like? How's it going to be? You know, they never ask you how much it costs, by the way. <laughs> because children don't have to because they know that you're covering the cost. Just like Jesus covered the cost. Okay, all right. And just, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel? I mean, here, this is the resurrected Jesus. This is the one that they saw die on a cross. And, and they saw him put into a tomb. They saw the stone rolled in front of the tomb. This is the one. They, this is the resurrected Christ. They know this is him. There's no question about it at this point. So their hopes are high, and they say, is it now? Is this now? Is the, has the time come for you to free Israel from Roman oppression and to restore our kingdom, to restore Israel? He replied, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. Guys, sense a theme here in what Jesus has to say about when he's coming back? So stop asking him. Stop. Stop supporting ministries that say they know because there's no way they can unless they've got some kind of revelation. Well, there's your revelation right there. No one knows but the Father. That's his job. And in fact, look at verse 8. He says, but you, and that word but, that's important. It's a conjunction. He says, so they're not for, those dates and times are not for you to know, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. I know some of you are going like, well, what does that have to do with the end times? Verse 8, what does that have to do? I like the way... Uh, the message puts it, you don't get to know the time. Timing is the Father's business. Or, or this is how I kind of paraphrased it. What you'll get is the Holy Spirit. 
You don't get to know the times. What you're going to get is the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes upon, when the Holy Spirit fills you. So in the meantime, between now and when I come again, he says, get busy. Represent me well. You are my witnesses. you got a lot of ground to cover. Um, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and, by the way, to the ends of the earth. you got a lot of ground to cover. Don't get distracted. Get busy with the kingdom work that I've given you. Look, there are some people, and, and I'm, 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 I want you to hear me, hear me clearly on this. We should be looking and longing for Jesus' return. So that we are not preoccupied with this life. But here's the thing. You've got work to do in this life. So you just need to work till it's quitting time. You just need to keep working hard till Jesus comes back and says, no more work. Now it's time for heaven. Now it's time for forever. See, our, our only certainty about Jesus' return is that it's imminent. And that word means simply that it could happen at any time. It's imminent. And whether we Christians live or die, we have nothing to fear because Jesus will come either with us or for us. Better say that again. Either you're going to be with Jesus coming back or, he, or you're going to be one of those he's coming for. He's either coming with us or for us. Friends, the fact of his return is the comfort that our world-weary hearts need. We so desperately need this truth, this revelation that Jesus is returning because our hearts are weary because of this world. So we can look forward to quitting time, but you can't stand at the, how many of you know, um, every, I know a lot of you have worked a job where you had to clock in and clock out, Okay. I remember my first job, I worked at a little department store called TGNY. And uh, anybody know anybody know what a TGNY? Oh yes, yes. My dad said it stood for toys, guns, and yo-yos. And uh, <laughs> seriously, they sold all of that. And uh, and I was a stock boy. That is the lowliest of the low in the in the hierarchy of department stores. I was a stock boy. And uh, emphasis on the word boy. Okay, I was 15 years old. My manager, his name was uh, Mr. Loisy Mesh. Mr. Mesh was a great Cajun guy. I mean, he was, he was wonderful. Um, taught me a lot of things. But the one thing that he taught me was, you can't stand by the clock. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Get toward the end of your shift, and there would be, a, there'd be people standing around the clock. They'd have their time card in there, and they're like, and they're, they're, just, they're just waiting. The problem was, the, here's the problem. People would, there'd be, there'd be a lineup at the clock 10 or 15 minutes before the shift ended. Don't let Mr. Mesh catch you there. I'm just telling you. Because he'll find you something to do. God, I remember one time, well, uh, me and my friend David, we were standing at the, at the uh, and Dave, if you're, if you're watching this online, man, I just wanted to know. It was David's idea. So uh, <laughs> probably not. <laughs> but we were standing at the clock because it, it, was, it was about 10 or 15 minutes out. And, we're, and we'd done all of our responsibilities. We'd done everything we, were, we had done. And we were just kind of killing time, okay, right, before we had to clock out. Because you couldn't clock out early. And you didn't want to clock out early because every minute was money. So we're standing there and we're just shooting the breeze. I don't know what we're talking about. And Mr. Mesh walked in. What are you doing here? Now, Mr. Mesh, I want you to get this picture. He was about 5'4", maybe 5'5", maybe five, five, okay, kind of slightly balding. He was really old, like, like about 45 or so. And, um, and he always smoked a cigarette. So he walks in, and he's got his cigarette in his hands. He goes, he says, what are you doing? And we're like, well, we're wait, we're, we got all our stuff done. We're waiting for the time clock. And he goes, you're not done. It's 
and he looks at the clock. He says, it's not time for you to clock out. And we're like, well, we got everything done. He goes, no, you, no, you didn't. And we're like, what do you, yeah, we did. We did everything that's on the list, everything you told us to do. And, he, and he's like, no, i got more for you to do. And he wouldn't make up work for us to do. He made up work for us to do. And it usually involved toilets in the bathroom. So we learn, don't stand by the clock, because if you stand by the clock, you're going to be cleaning toilets that we'd already cleaned, supposedly. So I, listen, Jesus is saying, don't stand by the clock. Stop standing by the clock, friends. You've got work to do. Work right up till quitting time. And then when Jesus, when, when the trumpet sounds, and we'll get to that, when the trumpet sounds and the voice of the archangel is heard, then it's time to quit or move on. Okay. Does that make sense? Look, Today's passage creates a perfect moment for each of us to examine our heart and see if we're ready to meet the Lord. Are you ready to meet the Lord? I like what John says, 1 John chapter 2. He says this, And now, dear children, remain in fellowship with Christ, remain in relationship with Christ, so that when He returns... You will be full of courage and not shrink back from him in shame. Work hard, in other words. Be in relationship with him. Work alongside him right up until the end so that you're not ashamed. Since we know that Christ is righteous, he says, we also know that all, we also know that all who do what's right are God's children. If you cross just over into chapter 3, it says this in verse 3. And all who have this eager expectation of Christ's return will keep themselves pure just as he is pure. Are you ready? Are you right with God? Are you pure? We used the word holy last week. If not, this is not the time to double down and work harder at being good. That might be a surprise to some of you because some of you are thinking, okay, what do I do? I got I to gotta get ready, so I, I'm going to work harder at being good. I'm going to work harder at being pure. I'm going to work harder at being holy. And, and see, this is what we do. We double down and we think it's all about us working harder at being good. But friends, there's no good without God. Just take the G, the O, and the D out of good, and you know what you're left with. An O, nothing. O. O. See, sometimes we think this is the way the world thinks. The world thinks I just I gotta work harder. I gotta do more. I gotta I gotta be good. You know, even if they're not thinking about heaven, well, actually they are because they're hoping against hope. Even though they have they don't have hope in Christ, they're hoping that their goodness will somehow get them into heaven. And there are Christians that think, I just got to work harder at being good and pure and holy. I got to just work harder. But friends, our hope is not in our efforts. Jesus is the one that, that makes being right with God possible. Paul told the believers in Corinth, for God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin on the cross, the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Not through your works, not through what you could ever hope to do, but through Christ. Jesus died on the cross so that our sins could be forgiven, so that heaven becomes not just a possibility, so that heaven becomes our destination. Because he makes us right with God. All we have to do is believe in him. I, no, 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 no. I don't mean believe the way you're thinking believe. Because some of you are going, well, I believe. I believe, in, I believe in Jesus. You believe in Jesus as a historical person. You believe in Jesus as maybe even as your savior. But do you believe in Jesus as your king, as your sovereign, as your Lord? Do 
you believe in Jesus in that way. All we have to do is believe in him, trusting in what he has done for us on the cross and trusting that the empty tomb confirms his finished work. It's why Paul writes in, John, in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, very familiar passage of Scripture. You know this, but I want you to hear it again. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it's by believing in your heart that you're made right with God. Believing in your heart, not in your head, believing in your heart that you are made right with God, and it's by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. That's what's going to happen in just a few minutes when we celebrate Aaron's baptism. She's believed in her heart, but she's also openly declaring. And isn't that what Jesus revealed to Nicodemus that evening on the rooftop? God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever say it, believes in him, will not perish, but have eternal life. Believe. That's where it begins. See, if you believe in Jesus for your salvation, then you must also believe in him, again, as your king. That he rules your life. That, that means that your way is no longer valid. Following your Pleasing yourself is no longer your goal. Now you want to live to please Him. Are you ready for Jesus' return? Are you ready to die? (laughs) That's a happy thought. (laughs) You better be. Come on. I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to instill fear in anybody. That's not, I, don't have to, I don't have to operate in guilt or fear. It's, that's just not my job. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. We need to be ready. Are you ready? Come on, if you're not. I, 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 know, I know some of you are like, come on, get on with it. I'm ready. And then there's some going, going come on, look at the time. Okay. If you're not ready. Come on, this is the moment. This is your moment. This is the opportunity for you to get ready. So come on. Don't let anything hold you back. Now, I'm going to say this, okay, because you're sitting around people you know. Chances are you're sitting around people you know. All right? Maybe not. But you're sitting around people you know. And and that thing makes this moment kind of of tension-filled because they know you. They probably know you. They probably know if you're ready or not. They could tell you, which means you really don't need to ask them because you already know, right? So it's not your job. It's not your job to, you know, put your hand, you know, on on your friend's shoulder and just say, dude, you're not ready to die. You're not ready for what's next. I'm just going to tell you. Now, a good friend might do that, okay? I'm just, but, but here's the thing. You know. But this isn't their decision. This is your decision. You hear me? This is not their decision. It's your decision. And you know if you're ready. So come on. If you believe, ask. Ask him to forgive your sin. Ask him to forgive every wrong thing you've done or thought or planned on doing. Ask him to forgive your sin because it's your sin that separates you from God. Right? So let's do that right now. God, I come to you. Father, I, I come to you. And, I, and Lord, I don't know where everyone is at today. Lord, I know that in, in between last Sunday and this Sunday, God, I know that I've, I've strayed. I've followed my own desires. I've, I've, I've wanted to please myself rather than please you. So, so in this moment, I know my own heart. I know my own life. I know if I'm ready or not. This is your moment. Come on. 
If you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, if you believe that Jesus is the one that makes you right with God, ask him to forgive your sins. Jesus, I come to you and I, I'm asking you to forgive my sins. Every wrong thought I've had, every wrong attitude, every action, every word, everything that I've done that falls under that heading of sin, I'm asking you to forgive me. Please, forgive me. Jesus, I believe this is why you came, so that so you, you took the penalty of my sin, not because you had sin, but because you took the penalty of my sin. And Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross for me. I believe that, Jesus. And I want to trust that right now. I want to trust what you've done for me. Thank you for forgiving my sin. Thank you, Jesus. I believe that you died for me. But I also believe, Jesus, that you rose again, that you're alive today that the tomb is empty, and that proves that you conquered death, that you conquered sin, that you conquered hell. I believe that, Jesus. And I'm asking you to be my Savior, and I want you to be my King. From this moment forward, I want to live different. I want to follow you. Jesus, you take the lead. Be my king. Be my Lord. Show me what to do. Show me how to live. Thank you for this new start you've given me today. Come on, if you prayed that prayer or something like it, friends, you are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. And the Bible says they will not be remembered against you ever again. Isn't that a relief? Come on, take a big, deep breath, friends. You don't bear the weight of that anymore. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for making me right with God. Now I want to live right. Holy Spirit, I pray that you'd fill, Lord, every heart, every life, that you would fill them. Be, be poured out from heaven and fill us, Holy Spirit. Fill us and help us to live holy. Help us to live pure. Help us to live looking and longing for Jesus' return, ready for what's next. Help us, Holy Spirit, I pray. Amen? Amen. Are you looking? Are you looking for? Are you longing for Jesus' return? Maybe you've been with us here today and you've been afraid of death and afraid of what's next. Heard a story about a sick man, you can be seated, about a sick man who was in, a, in his doctor's office. He was terminally ill. He knew that he was going to die. The doctor spoke with him for a little bit, and then he turned, and he was getting ready to leave the exam room. And, and the man said to him, doctor, I, I'm afraid to die. Tell me, tell me what lies on the other side. Very quietly, the doctor said, I, I don't know. You don't know. You, you, you're a Christian man. You, you should know. You, you're telling me you don't know what's on the other side? The doctor had his hand on the handle of the door. And all of a sudden on the other side of the door came a, came a sound of scratching and whining. And as he opened the door, his golden retriever sprang into the room and leaped on him with eager an eager show of gladness. <laughs> Turning to the patient, the doctor said, you see my dog? He's never been in this room before. He, he didn't know what was on the inside. 
He didn't know anything except that his master was here. And when the door opened, he sprang into the room without fear. The doctor said, I know little of what's on the other side of death, but I do know one thing. I know my master is there, and that's enough. Come on. The Bible is so honest, and, and you've got to hear this last promise, and we'll begin our service with this next week. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12. Paul says, now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then, he says, we'll see everything. Then, then we will see everything with perfect clarity. He says, all that I know now is partial and incomplete, but then I will know everything, just as God knows me completely. That's what we have to look forward to, friends. The master's on the other side of the door, and he's waiting. Somebody said, so I know this, and I'll, I'll share it next week, but somebody said, you know, when, when we die, and we go, you hear these stories about angels meeting you, and, and, you know, and, or St. Peter at the gates, hogwash. It's not true. It's not in the Bible. That's why I can say that with, with absolute authority, friends. It's not true. It's not in the Bible. The first face you'll see in heaven is his face. Jesus' face. It's not an angel greeting you, high-fiving you at the door. It's Jesus at the door saying, welcome home. Welcome to your forever home. Amen? Amen? Amen. We've got something to look forward to. And whether we reach heaven because we die on this side of eternity or Jesus comes back and takes us to eternity, friends, that's what we have to look forward to. Seeing him. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.